So good morning, everyone. It's good nice morning. to be here. First lecture of 2023. Um, I want to welcome each one of you, the ones who are following us online. Um, I'm sorry, the slides for whoever's watching home is backwards. I got some comments on, um, on Facebook because the way they're seeing it, but um, don't worry, we'll go over them very slowly so everybody should be able to follow. I decided to talk about powers of the soul. Always think about January, we are starting the new year. Some of us have taken some time to set some new goals um, or to commit to old ones that have not been fulfilled in the past year. But no matter what, it's always good at any given time to remember the powers that we have within our soul. We focus a lot for good reason on our deficits, on our limitations, on what um, limits us in so many ways, but we forget the amazing resources that we have within us that <clears throat> by forgetting we do not tap into them as much as we should we do not take advantage of them uh, in our favor to propel us forward towards you know what we have set up for ourselves as our goal so that's what that's what made me want to talk about this uh, today and I'm going to open with this quote from John, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these. Because it really reminds us that when I read these, I think, well, the sky is the limit. Because if we are capable of doing all the things that Jesus did and more, it seems like it's unlimited, right? What lies ahead of us. And so it's, again, we live in a in a paradigm of limitations, of scarcity. So we constantly like putting ourselves down. But Christ told us about our potentialities, the God, remind us of the God that lies within us. So I think one of the most powerful things that we have is the power of consciousness, awareness, and presence. And so it's not for any other reason that our center is called conscious living, right? Because there's nothing more powerful than to be conscious of the present moment, of who we are. And that's what, again, this talk intends to, to bring awareness and consciousness to, to who we are as children uh, of God. So first thing I want to uh, talk about is the power of our minds. And everything else that I'm going to talk about lies within the power of the mind. And this slide is meant to illustrate a very important concept that the mind and the brain are separate things. So in white, you have the mind. And I love these pictures, and that's where my mind goes, right? So you have all the organized dots, which is our ideas, is, you know, all the content that is within the self, within the mind, and then that is transmitted to the brain. So the brain is not the source of our thoughts, of our desires, of our impulses, but rather a physical instrument that's going to capture those signals, those messages from the spirit, and it's going to process and it's going to um, act at the physical level. Now, when we think about the mind, so what are we talking about? And here's some, I kind of broke down some long definitions from Andrew Lewis, but we are talking about a nuclei of intelligent forces, source of an unknown force, the mental energy. So we, we know very little about this energy, the mental energy, the, the energy that is derived from our minds. But it is a force. 
And it is through this energy, the mental energy, that we project using the invisible threads of our thoughts, who we are, in addition to acting over others. So we have this mental energy that is produced by our minds and we are constantly projecting that in the form of thoughts. And this projection speaks about who we are and influences all the people who are around us. Now the brain, on the other hand, is the nest of the mind. So again, it's just separated from the mind. A brain without the mind, without the spirit, is dead matter, right? It doesn't produce anything. So this first slide is just to meant to tell us that we have this force, that's the force of the mind, this mental energy that we are manipulating, that is being projected. And that has a huge impact in our lives. So how conscious are you of your mind? How conscious are you of this energy? How conscious are you of what this energy is doing for you each and every day, each and every moment? Now the mind has some elements. So we have impulses. The impulses, they talk about the power of our reactions. Our impulses are there. They are our survival mechanism, right? So it kind of, it's there to defend us, to protect us, to want to make us thrive and live in this world. We have the desires, they carry the power of our themes. So each one of us has a theme, right? A, a, a primary, a key issue in your psychology, in your history, in your experience that you carry within you is the theme of your incarnation. So if you don't know what's yours, Think about it. What is the primary area that you have been called to work on? Is there one big theme? Maybe we have several themes, but they will manifest a lot of times in the form of our desires. We have reason, which is the power of being human. No other species can reason but us. So that is a powerful thing that we have. We have memory, which brings the power of our story. That is a force within us that we can tap into to look, for example, about our experiences. What have we learned from them? Our journeys, what we have not learned from them, what needs to be learned. We have the power of our imagination, which is our creative power. We are constantly creating. We have the power of will, which is the power of our wanting, and I'm going to get more into those. And we have the sentiment, which is the power of our feelings. So I don't know if you realize that or not, but all that lies within our minds, influence our minds, influence the byproduct of our minds, which is our thoughts. So being aware of these forces within us empower us to take better control in whatever we can in our lives, in our reality. So let's start with memory. And I just really, we talk about memory, we talk about spiritual memory, but I really, really like this definition by Andrew Lewis in the book Between Heaven and Earth. It says, memory can be compared to a sensitive plate that under the influx of light keeps forever the images collected by the spirit in the course of its innumerable apprenticeships within life. Each existence of our soul in a certain expression of form is an addition of experience preserved in a prodigious file of images that by superimposing one another never get confused. Now that is, it's, it's fantastic, right? It's a fantastic thing. So what that means is all our lives, all our experiences, everything that has had meaning and an emotional impact on us is within us. 
whether we are conscious or not, and it's a force within us. It's a force that affects everything that we do, how we go on about our lives. Now, what's really, really interesting about this is that Andrew Lewis is going to tell us that when they are doing assistance works, they're helping other spirits, right? Such as the one they attempted to do on that book, on that story. It's necessary to resort to the mental archives in order to produce certain types of vibration to attract the presence of companions linked to the suffering brother that we propose to help. Let me translate this to something very simple. So what he's saying is that they are trying to help a spirit. So what they need to do is they need to access the archives of the memory of that spirit. And so they need to produce a vibration. They need to bring that to life. Think about it as it is there, but it's dormant. So it's like getting a little, doing a ping, right? To make it vibrate and surface that memory, okay? When that memory surfaces, then it will attract the spirits. They're related to that case, to that story with whom that spirit has unfinished business. So to unlock the mind's recess in the hidden fibers where the mind holds its afflictions and invisible wounds. So we carry within ourselves, our stories, our accomplishments, um, our learnings, but also our wounds, our unfinished business, and the spirits do that. Now, you know what else does that? Pain. Pain does that. Pain, a lot of times, when it's powerful enough, it has this ability to unlock some of our memories. Sometimes they are not clear memories, but they're feelings related to the memories. And we are able to revisit certain contents and areas that we need to. So, when it comes to memory, just knowing that we bring this force within us, knowing that there is a way we are capable of accessing, of course, with limits whenever we incarnate it, because it's not so easy to get to the unconscious, but knowing that those forces are acting upon us. Um, it's an important element as we try to capitalize on our resources, inner resources, moving forward into the new year and can appreciate the, the difficulties and, and, and the obstacles that come into our lives as sometimes a source and a bridge to content that lies within us and that's important for us to access or better understand or become conscious of. Another thing that is important is our sentiment, right? The power of our sentiment. And I'm going to um, go back to Andrew Lewis when he says that we know in photography that the cliche is the negative image obtained in the dark room from which we can extract innumerable positive proofs. So talking a little bit about photography just to give us an analogy between thoughts and feelings. In the same way, thought is the matrix that we compose in the intimacy of, of the being with which it is possible to create infinite manifestations of our individuality. So the thoughts are created within us very much like the images are created within the dark room. However, the formation of the cliché depends on the sensitive film that in our case is the feeling that precedes any and all elaboration of mental order. Verily, thought is the cause of action, but feeling is the vibrating mode in which thought and cause are formed. Feelings uh, model the idea. So what's really, this is so powerful and it gives the, the rationale for why 
in spiritism, we talk so much about self-knowledge, right? Because we're looking here, we, we, we're going to talk about, you know, today with like, you know, psychology and coaching, people are talking a lot about positive thinking, and I'm going to get a little bit into it. But we need to understand what is underneath the thoughts. And positive thinking is not as simple as people like to think or like to say. Because what we are learning here is that preceding, prior, the formation of the thought, there is feelings, sentiments. So when the thought is formed, that feeling is going to add to that thought, color vibratory frequency, density. I can say that person is very good. Somebody is a very good human being. Somebody else may say the same thing. That person is a very good human being. When person A said it, underneath the statement, there is a feeling of envy. When person B said it, underneath that statement, there is a feeling of love and admiration. It's the same statement, a completely different thought and a completely different reality that these two people are living in. One is living in a very altruistic place. One is miserable. They're saying the same thing. The thought is the same, but it's really not the same. It's the same in the words, but the reality of the thought is really the sentiment behind. That's why, that's why, think positive. It's not just about putting pretty words in your brain. You gotta understand what is the feeling underneath. And positive thinking has done an incredible disservice to human mental health in many ways, all right, because it dismisses a very important component, a very key component about humanity, which is our feelings. Now, feelings are the conductor of electrochemical processes of the body, stimulating areas that transform, lead, and materialize our emotional expressions and attitudes. All that to say that you feel there's a chemical response in your body, okay? Just as the atom is a living and powerful form within its context, but passive before the intelligence that can use it for good or evil, so is the mental particle, the, our mental energy. Despite its strength, it's passive before the power of feelings that gives it form and nature for good or ill, right? So again, I hear just an analogy between the mental energy and the atom. So a process that accumulates fluids that generate both disease and health and offers different qualities such as acidic or balsamic, sweet or bitter, life-giving or deadly, nourishing or exhausting among others. So the feelings that we nurture, right, they are producing chemical reactions within us and once they are accumulated and nurtured, they will produce different states within us of health or of disease, of illnesses. So all this due to the power of feelings which characterizes the process and takes shape as a way of emotional desire, giving direction, intensity, consistency, disposition and order. So this slide basically is just to tell us about, again, the force and the power of our feelings in establishing our reality, not only outside of us, but within us, even to the point of affecting our physical health. Then we have will, the power of will. So willpower is evolutional impulse. What does that mean? It's not automatic. It's something that you have to put to action consciously. You have to activate. Is the main power of the soul 
is an attribute of the self, so belongs to the spirit, acts over consciousness with energy and perseverance towards the soul's desires, <clears throat> wants and what it wishes to accomplish, side by side with feelings and thoughts. So willpower, I did a, um, a little reel another day about this as I was studying it and someone said, oh, that's great, I didn't know that I could develop my willpower. Sure, you can develop your willpower. So we have the ability to, to nourish, to strengthen and to direct our willpower. It's not so easy because you have the will of the self and you have the will of the ego. And in the same way that we see, we have this sense that evil is prevalent in this world and there's no good going on, part of it is because evil is loud. Same thing with the ego. The ego is loud. It likes to show off. So it's always screaming, always making noise. So sometimes it's not that we don't have willpower, but we have a conflict of wills within ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we must strengthen our willpower in the right direction. And the more intellectually and morally developed that we are, the better conditions we're gonna have to exercise this very fundamental impulse of life in the right direction. Because you can use a lot of willpower to do very, very harmful things, right? So the, the intellectual and moral development will help us to channel this will in the right direction, which when well conducted can add achievements and leverage self-esteem. Because the more we get it right, the first beneficiaries of that, it's us. We realize that we are capable, more than capable, that we are goodness in essence so the more we get things right our self-esteem starts to, to to build from observing these very precious miracles within our own selves so the willpower can make the mind a state of imprisonment or liberation and like i said it dwells between the noble interests promoted by reason and the rationalizations of the ego which wants to maintain the inferior impulses that it is identified. <clears throat> then we have our thoughts. So a lot of material already for us to think about on how we can take those forces and put them to good use. The thoughts are the byproduct of our minds, right? And so when we look at our thoughts, um, Dias da Cruz will say is the force that determines, establishes, transforms, builds, destroys, and rebuilds. So in Kardec, we're going to learn that the thoughts are for the spirit, what the hands are for the incarnate being. It is with the thoughts that we are manipulating the energies around us and within us. And we are constructing. We are destroying, constructing, remodeling. It's an ongoing permanent, well, permanent for a long time, remodeling of our own beings, right? So it is an extension of our inner nature. It is our own individuality in action. To think is to manifest the soul. So whatever we're thinking, this is our identity, okay? So when the spirit looks at us, does not see this beautiful face of mine. It sees my spiritual identity, that I'm projecting through my thoughts with everything that goes into the thoughts. I also like this analogy that we are like um, this battery creating and accumulating electrical charges, influencing and being influenced. So we are very electric, magnetic, right? Powerful. There's a lot of powerful in being. There's a lot of forces being moved within us, projected, receiving. It's a very alive um, environment. 
Each individuality does according to the feelings it nourishes in the spiritual structure and according to the thoughts it entertains in the mind, attracts, repels, builds, destroys through the force, forces it emits in works, words, and attitudes. So it's not only what we're doing, it's not only what we're saying, it's just what we're thinking. Everything is contributing to where we are in our lives. So that calls for the awareness of what we're saying, what we're doing, what we're thinking, and understanding that we have the power to change our realities, our experiences, by tapping into these forces, by studying, by understanding what they are, by using our willpower in the right direction, putting our resources, our energy, our time into what truly matters and can really help us to power up, to develop all these potentialities within us. So in the physical dimension, thought is imponderable matter, okay, which we call mental matter. And this mental matter is going to follow the universal law of gravitation. It's matter. So again, it can generate imprisonment or it can open our path to the heights according to our interests. My question to you is, what is or what are your interests today? What interests you in life? That's something for us to meditate. What are we attracted to? When you look at our management and administration of time and resources, where are they going? Towards what? So when we think of thoughts, we're thinking of feelings. They are being influenced by our will. They are being influenced by our memory, by our story. They're being influenced by our desires, so our thoughts are not black and white. On the contrary, they are rich, rich with content, with layers. So when you say positive thoughts, what are you talking about? Right? Let's be positive in 2023. So I'll tell you what toxic positivity is. Toxic positivity is denying that you have problems. Denying that you have, oh, let's forget about it. Let's think positively. Kill me. Right? Denying feelings. Thinking that it's good to feel guilty or ashamed. That's positive. No, there's nothing positive on that. What's positive should be responsible, sure. What's positive thinking is, is never lose sight of who you are as a mortal being. Never lose hope in yourself. This is positive. It's to have the, the frame of immortality helping you to never give up on yourself. But positive thinking it includes also the ability to bear, to make peace with the present moment with where you are in your evolution and, and, and come to terms that you are on the construction. There's no two ways about it, right? We have the power of choice, power of choice. So we need to look at, are we in the childhood stage where our choices are primarily on our basic needs? I want to eat, I want to sleep. No, I want to survive. Or are you on teenager years where our choices are associated with our immediate desires? I want to stay up until three o'clock in the morning. I want to go out now, even though it's 1 a.m. I want, I want, I want what I want without much understanding of consequences. Or are we is our wanting at this time um, an ideal that is the result of the elaboration of our feelings, of our thoughts? And is our wanting 
Does our wanting has a direction, a purpose, a meaning? Is it supported by our will? So what is it that we want? What are, what are, what are our interests and what is that we want for ourselves in this year? In this day so healing peace harmony happiness will always come from the force of life itself channel correctly okay so now we're gonna get into okay how are we gonna do this right we look at into some of the forces now we need to take these forces and channel them correctly the force of life is within us. We be talking about it. Those are the forces of life, the forces of the spirit, the forces of the law, of progress, for example, of cause and effect. These forces, they are outside, they are within us, and when we channel them correctly, that's going to take us to the place that we are after. So rightly, we need to do things rightly. So in the Spirit's book, we're going to learn that we only are happy when we are away from God's law. Right? So I have many other lectures where I have developed and talk about this statement. But I would say it's always, always important. If this is, we are only unhappy when we are away from God's laws, what are God's laws? Right? So... Think about that. What would that be? But we all have our conscience. We have that inner voice that's telling us, I know you're doing this. I know you want to insist on this. You know this is not the best for you. And it's there, nagging us. We all have heard it. So, in the book, Plenitude by Joana de Angelis. If you haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend it. Talks about suffering, talks about healing, talks about the Eightfold Path for Salvation from Buddha, which we're going to get into because we're here all seeking to be saved, right? Saved from our own selves, right? No, no, in spiritism, we don't believe in the devil, in uh, the outside forces, we are, the darkness is within, the ignorance, the illusions, whatever keeps us from the straight path is within. So Buddha has proposed this, and what I did is I seek some of Christ's statements to put a parallel with Buddha, so we can look at this path of salvation. Eight items. First one, when Jesus healed us, in one way or another, he always asked, do you believe I can heal you? Do you believe? And what we know is that once we believe, we contribute to our healing by priming, a word of this, this era, right? We prime our bodies, we prepare our bodies, we create the optimal environment for healing to take place. This way, when we, when we believe we produce substances, they are responsible for the organic, emotional, and psychic remake, and we become receptive, more receptive to the forces of the good spirits, of God, of nature. It's like we Basically, we open the windows. We make it easier for healing to take place. So the first uh, item in Buddha's path of salvation is to believe rightly. To direct the thought in a positive, edifying way, establishing itself in healthy purposes, favoring the accomplishments of the values in which one believes. So, belief is important, but we have to believe rightly in the right direction. Faith can do everything as it activates unexplored intimate mechanisms of man, generators of unused forces, 
completely modify first his internal landscape, then the external. So we, like I said, we use a tiny fraction of our brain power, faith. If we strengthen our faith, we also become more capable of mobilizing forces within us that are unused. And that's something that, you know, we are starting to, to do now, kind of mind work, using our minds, tap into our faith, really we're capable of changing our inner environment. Faith is the channeling of all psychic possibilities by altering the action of habitual forces. When it presents itself, it stimulates action, vibrating from within, generating energies that vitalize the being. This is why believe rightly goes right along with faith move mountains. Because faith, again, has this ability to shift, to tap into forces. They're available to us. We don't know them. Now, when Paul asked Jesus, Lord, what do you wish me to do? He was wanting to know what was Jesus want for him? Which brings me to our second step, which is, so we have to believe rightly. We have to want rightly. So many of our sufferings is caused by this excessive mistaken desire according to the illusions of immediate and hallucinatory pleasure that lacks the expendable to the detriment of the personal according to the transitory, not to the permanent. This is one of the Angelis. So the preservation of wanting with rectitude rejects ennoble proposals, even when presented as salvationist formulas or solutions. So wanting rightly is wanting from a mortal perspective. What do you want for yourself? What's really important for you? Men shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, because we don't live, we, we, the same way we have to nurture our bodies, we have to nurture our souls. And so what we say, the words, they, they mean, they can, words are powerful, they can nourish or they can destroy. So talking rightly is important. We need to realize the power of our words. Maybe I have a very imbalanced thought and I'm not saying anything. That in itself is toxic. But the image that came to my mind when I was doing this is I'm carrying my toxic bag and then I go in the middle of the street and I open it and I let all the trash out. Now it's not only toxic for me, right, but I'm also making my environment even more toxic, affecting other people's lives. So we have a responsibility for what we say. Good words strengthen the character, sweeten the heart, and light up life. The bad ones numb the feelings, deform the behavior, and kill the ideas of a nobleman. So, again, believe rightly. And what was the one before? One, believe, want, speak. It's getting harder, no? Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. So now we enter in the operating, in the doing, in the construction. So operating right, doing things right, is both preventive therapy technique and a cure for suffering. Those who do not act wrong, do not need to repeat the experience, retrace the path, pay off the debt. So this is, this is a good one. So we may not be able to fix everything at once, but let's try not to make more damage as we move forward. Let's try to do damage control. Why are we doing the work of reconstruction, right? Understanding that in order to do damage control, we need to work on those things prior.
Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This takes us to the next one, which is living rightly. So it's not only about, I'm going to do things right. It's about, I'm going to live right. It's not a momentary thing. Now it's not like a moment to moment thing, but it's like a, a, a way of living. It's just like diet, right? You do diet here, there, here, there, you know, back and forth, back and forth. This is operating right. You're trying to get things right. But then it comes to a point that you say, it's not about dieting. It's about eating properly for life. So it goes from being modus operandi to modus vivendi. It's about choosing to live rightly. And this is what Jesus did. He lived according to his values, consistently. He lived up to the bare necessities of life for him. Only one thing was important, to give himself in a world of things that are worth what is attributed to them, since they have no real value. This sentence is reverberating within me since I read it. We live in a world that we attribute things, a value, that is not real. It's not real. So we die to buy things that someone decided was going to cost that much money. And we decided in our craziness that in having that, your worth as a human being is higher. And we live in this madness, believing, believing that the value of material things is real. All of us. It's completely losing sight of what is really important. So that is like, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm working on that one within myself. I'm working on that one. But whoever endures to the end, he will be saved. It brings us to correct effort. So, no one lives effortlessly, right? Oh, this is too much effort. Well, this is life. Because once we surpass the limits of automatic phenomena, Life demands the commitment of the will and the application and direction of energy. So, roll up the sleeves because it will take effort. If you want to change your reality, it will take effort and correct effort. When two or three are gathered in my name, then I am among them. Which brings to our last two items, which is thinking and meditating rightly. So correct thinking brings, provides psychological harmony and harmony with the benefactors of humanity. Beneficial energies are drawn from this psychic experience. So not only thinking correctly will help us with our inner world and, and health, it will project a better reality within us, but will also allow us to connect with our benefactors. And meditating rightly is making sure that we have the time to listen, to listen and to get to know our own soul. So I will close with this um, prayer that says, Lord, help me move from darkness to light, from the light to the truth, and from death to immortality. So, beneath all of this needs to be this desire to be each day more and more a immortal being, to live each day more and more as a mortal being, to be curious about those things. Who are we? 
we are blessed. We are, we are divine beings. We are not alone. God made us with all the abilities to overcome whatever it is that we are undergoing. All the tools to walk the path of enlightenment, they lie within us like these seeds of light waiting for us to take care of them like David does with his flowers, right? But that same level of care needs to go to our inner divine garden with the proper water, the proper attention, the observation. We need to look. But the most powerful force, again, nothing, nothing can be done once we lose hope. So for the year of 2023, if I had to wish anything for anyone, is to keep up with hope. Because hope is this, is this soft breeze that runs through us. And in the moments of heat, in the moments of despair, it is God's caress telling us, I'm here with you. Don't lose sight of the light. So, to all of you, Happy New Year.